I'm actually considering very, very soon to go back and watch Flipping Oppenheimer. I know the first time I watched it, it was like, what, two and a half hours or however long it is. And it did feel like a bit of a drag towards the second half of the movie. But I'm still thinking about how amazing that Christopher Nolan directed movie was, um, especially in a world where, for the most part, content in the most part TV series, for the most part movies kind of are a little bit dead. They're a little bit rubbish now. It's not the greatest time. I think the people on strike now don't really have much of a leg to stand on when you think about the quality of writing that goes on in some of these studios and production houses and stuff, I'm pretty sure you could get a normal, decent AI to basically write something along the same lines of stuff that's been written now for these shows. So when a real genius director um, is able to kind of do what he does best without any, you know, unnecessary sort of like, you know, gender gender box ticking or racial box ticking and just is able to try his best to put together a really good movie. What ends up happening is that you end up getting Oppenheimer. And I was really impressed by it. I was really kind of blown away by it. More so because of the lingering questions it kind of had in your mind in terms of, you know, a movie goer thinking what would you have done, you know, in the place of Oppenheimer? Um, you know, where do you stand on that kind of moral decision? Like, was he complicit? And did he know what he was doing? Was he just an innocent scientist or whatever it may be that was just trying to do something, you know, to help humanity? And then, you know, um, he didn't really intend to kind of, you know, basically set the dominoes falling for the atomic bomb. We don't really know, but I feel like that ability to kind of leave something resonating in you. And again, I saw Oppenheimer many weeks ago, I think maybe three weeks ago. So the fact that I'm still thinking about it three weeks later, I feel like it's a good sign for how great that movie was. And I honestly, 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 um, really want to go and check it out and see it. And um, maybe I'm going to go see it a second time. It's going to be a bit difficult to get through because now I know how long it is. I feel like when you ever go to the movies, especially myself, I tend to not watch trailers. I tend to not check the runtime. I just kind of go there blind because I just want to, you know, basically surrender myself to the movie and kind of see where it takes me. But watching something the second time, knowing how long it is and stuff, it might be a bit of a drag. So I might need some um, chemical help to kind of get me through it. But I really am considering going and watching a second time. And I think that's the greatest review that I can kind of pay to that movie. I also like that, that he had many different cameos in it where most of the actors didn't really say too many words um especially like really like you know well-known and amazing actors and i feel like that's something as well you don't get enough of because people nowadays if you have somebody incredibly well known you're going to want to get the most out of them but i feel like he does well because he's a very respected director of course Christopher nolan but then everybody else that wants to work in these movies is just happy to be there so they're not demanding that they have like starring roles and stuff so essentially it helps the whole entire story because he's then allowed to just tell the story the way he wants if he just wants to use you for you know a couple of lines or for your face or for an expression or for just your figure or whatever maybe that's all included so i really did like um that and i thought he did a really good job of kind of displaying that with some of the cameos that were made throughout the entire series and of course or movie sorry and of course cillian murphy i think that people are calling it's a thing that his, his name is not pronounced Syrian right it's called like Killian or something I forgot how you meant to pronounce his name but the guy who plays Oppenheimer is fantastic more so for the non-dialogue scenes like the play you know the scenes where he's able to kind of emote anguish and torment I think that's the I think, I'm sure those are probably like acting class 101 things that you do when you first try to you know become an actor when you go through classes i'm sure that's one of those exercises you do in the beginning to try and express emotion without saying words but jesus christ he does it really well to the point where now his face that anguish sort of face is now become a meme in itself that people are now using all over social media that goes to show just how powerful that whole entire scene was and how much it resonated with people um still to this day i think the most you know the funnest or the one of the best scenes i actually like two of them was a scene with casey affleck's act um role casey affleck plays some guy i think who's from the fbi is it from the fbi or something no fbi forgot where he's from but he's a general but i guess he's like you know he's involved in the dark arts let's say he's somebody that's obviously an expert in torture and all that kind of stuff right or maybe information extraction or something you know some sort of like pc or like non-brutal way that they describe in a movie and that Casey Affleck role, the way he's able to, um, you know, exude terror 
and fright without actually being super threatening without being physical without shouting really loudly but you can tell he's a dangerous man you can tell he's somebody that Oppenheimer doesn't want to get on the bad side of and I feel like he did that amazingly so that was a brilliant scene and then the other scene of course is the one where I think Oppenheimer goes to meet the president in and then they're discussing where they're going to drop the atomic bomb and he decides to cross off Kyoto because he says that I think in a movie oh my me and my wife did you know we enjoy going there on vacation and it's a really kind of dark you know joke to make which i laughed at in the movie i think i was maybe one of the only people in a the theater to i kind of laugh at it but it is something that kind of you know jolts you because you can imagine somebody actually saying that you know in the war room while they're discussing which places to go and eventually bomb they decide you know what we're not going to bomb this place because this is somewhere that you know my daughter likes to go fishing or to go sunbathing or you know i import my fucking exotic horses from here or i like to go to backpack there like it's all those kind of you know really crazy things that sometimes lead to you know these really out you know outside sort of outcomes and it kind of reminds me a little bit of that story that i've kind of shared on here a few times about why a lot of the for a lot of the kind of field raves in london or in the uk in general kind of got shut down and why there was there's a lot of laws around like you know gathering of people in certain places because I think the story goes somewhere along the lines of sometime in the 80s or 90s, they threw a field rave somewhere. And unfortunately, the place where they fit, they threw it was at an estate or the grounds of somebody very high up. And that person had connections with people in the government. And they basically, you know, were pissed off that all these ravers came and destroyed their fields. And um, after that one occasion, they put into action loads of laws and restrictions that basically made it pretty impossible to have really large kind of quote unquote illegal gatherings of these field raves. So all it took was just one minor occur one minor inconvenience for somebody um, very high up and that completely changed the course of history when it comes to um, dance music and clubbing and whatnot in in London because obviously that does have ramifications to like opening times or whatever it may be and you know it kind of keeps rumbling until now so it's kind of eerie to see that guy be so flippant and basically rub off Kyoto because it's just a place that him and his wife like to vacation absolutely crazy but um again like I said great movie would definitely watch it again if anything of a slight sort of um feedback or slight sort of thing i'd say maybe the second half of the movie um is the best part maybe i think especially if you're coming in there blind and you don't really know much about oppenheimer and the history of the atomic bomb and whatnot but um i still think the first half was great and I, and i love the fact that i really 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 love the fact that um what they end up doing is that they avoided trying to overly explain everything to you I love that in the movie. They just kind of dropped you in at the deep end. I thought that was really important. They didn't try to tell you who was who and whatever. It just They just dropped you in the deep end and you just had to kind of gather it along the way. And I think in the most part, if you were paying somewhat of attention, even if you didn't and you stepped through it and you just jumped in on the second half, you could probably figure out what was going on in Oppenheimer. So I really did enjoy that. So I'm really, really odd on that. Um, yeah, someone mentioned here, yeah. Yeah, this, I would say... Well, so I, mentioned, um, I saw a sex scene yeah the, the sex scene i would say isn't odd i think the more odd part of the sex scene is what happens after when um oppenheimer and the woman that he's with his mistress are just sitting down in the chairs fully naked talking to each other i think that's probably the odd part of the story i think the sex scene kind of is what it is i think it, he does it fairly well in that regard especially in the context of the whole movie him that being the mistress and them having a very kind of you know physical relationship where they kind of can't keep their hands off each other but i think just the scene of them just sitting down after the fact with their fucking you know pussies and their balls on these you know on these very gaudy looking chairs in the hotel it's just a bit i mean like the first thing i'd want to do is get a pair of under get some underwear on or put or just put a towel on or a bathrobe you know what i mean it just feels a bit odd that they're just sitting there with their fucking you know with their gnashes out having a bit of a chin wag after they're just done banging that was the only strange bit of the whole entire thing but i thought overall um they did it fairly well it came across really good and legitimately like i said i'm definitely definitely considering watching it again but i'm just a bit worried about the runtime and whether or not i might go back there and actually be bored you know actually think you know what maybe this isn't the place for me maybe i should be staying at home but i still do want to watch barbie too i haven't watched that yet i think that's still on the list to go and check out and i think as per usual 
I would also like to check it out when I'm there. You know, I don't want to go. And so I, I would want to check it out in the cinema. I don't want to watch this like on HBO Max or something. I think a movie like that deserves to be watched in the cinema or just not at all, personally. Or maybe it's a movie where I think a lot of people will end up watching Barbie on, on the plane when it does eventually come out on streaming services. It'll probably be available on planes. And I think a lot of people will probably end up watching Barbie on a plane and figuring out, oh, this is actually quite a decent movie. Um, So that probably might happen. But again, I personally would rather that it be um, seen in the cinemas if possible but we'll see what happens and we'll see what happens that's